All right, we're going to be back in Hosea. We ended in chapter 8, uh, kind of the kind of the tail end of it. Uh, let me see. Yeah, we stopped at about verse 8. Um, could I get somebody to read verses 8? Just 8 through 14 all together, I think, is probably a good thing. You want to do it all? 8, 8 through 8, 14, rather? Yeah, 8 through 14. <clears throat> Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein there is no pleasure. For they are gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers, yea, they have hired among the nations. Now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes, because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin. Altars shall be made unto him to sin. <clears throat> I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings, and eat it. But the Lord accepted them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath forgotten his maker and built temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and then those shall devour the palaces thereof. All right. Let's... To just get back in the context of what's going on, if you recall that uh, God has, Ephraim is supposed to be the leader of Israel, supposed to make sure that they stay worshiping God, and they have failed in, in that position. So God has, through Hosea, he has declared judgment against uh, Israel, really against Samaria, Samaria's calf, which is their, her religious system. That she had gone into, and we talked about some of the some of the prophetic things in uh, First Kings chapter twelve that was going to happen to that calf, but it was going to thrust Israel into um, kind of a battleground with the the kind of the state of Assyria, the civilization of Assyria, that they were going to have to start contending with that, and. At first, Israel has has trusted Assyria and made some handshake deals with them, and it didn't end very well. I want to read to you. In fact, someone can help me read this. If you'll turn to 2 Kings chapter 15, and just kind of hold a, a finger in that in that spot, because we're going to be looking at several things from 2 Kings as we see uh, these this prophecy unfold um, in the scriptures, and not just in the scripture, but there is some, there's been some archaeological finds during this time, too, that confirms um, the individuals that were present and some of the things that happened to them. So 2 Kings chapter 15, anybody there? Yeah. They're all slow getting there. I'll let someone. You want to read it? Okay, go ahead. Uh, my other Isaac. Read 15, 18 through 21. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Pol, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahim gave Pol a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. And Menahim exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, of each man fifty shekels of silver, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. And the rest of the acts of Menahim and all that he did are not written in the book of the chronicles of the king of Israel. So here we have that uh, he's Menahim is trusting Assyria to uh, to keep its promise. Hey, we're paying you off leave us alone the problem is assyria you know they did for a little bit but when you pay off when you pay off a kingdom you know to to not come get you then uh, really what you're doing is you're inviting them to return for more they always will want more because now they're like oh you're weak uh, so we can get whatever we want from you we can you know we're gonna we're gonna get what we want now, just a few things about this King Menahem. He does appear in archaeological records as a, kind of an 8th century ruler in Israel. 
they had found, you know, those, those seals, you know, they would have a ring that they would wear whenever they would seal legal documents. So they, and they call those bu uh, bullions or a bull, which is a, like a seal impression, right? That's the name that they did it. So it's like a piece of clay, but it's got the symbol of the king and it just has his name and like authorized by King Menahem or something like that. So they've actually found several of those bulla things, which are just broken off seals in some of the archeological finds. Now the, the, the guy that Menahem has to deal with, his name actually comes up several times too. His name is uh, Terza. Uh, so Menahem has some dealings with him and then he ends up have you know, like a like you know, at first they pay them off, but they come back and they want more. So they're really forcing a fight when they do that kind of thing. So it ends up forcing Israel into a fight. Uh, Israel will end up losing this fight. Now, just like you know, just like when the Russians went into the Ukraine, what 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 happened as Russia was entering into Ukraine? What happened? Do y'all remember? Your, there were there there was just millions of refugees, right? Mm -hmm. So before war begins in a nation, a lot of times that there's many refugees that happen. So that's exactly what happened in Israel too. Uh, Assyria is coming in. The refugees start they start going in the opposite direction of Assyria. Well, Assyria is to the east, so they're going to go west. What's west of Israel? Yeah, well, you, you got to go on dry land. What's west? Egypt. E Egypt. So the, here the scripture, t it, uh, Hosea is telling him, he's like, Assyria is going to come in, and you, many of you are going to run for your lives, and you're going to go to Egypt. And that's basically what the prophecy said, that, he was, that this is what is going to happen. That's not like metaphorical, like you're being returned to bondage, like you're being returned you're, you're going to be cast out of your land. You're going to be back into slavery and servitude. It, it's it's twofold. I mean, Egypt often represents you know slavery and bondage, but in this sense, it's actually twofold. It's you are returning to bondage because they ended up going the the ones who stayed ended up becoming um, bond slaves to Assyria. The ones who fled, they went back to Egypt and they just kind of disappeared into the culture of Egypt. And basically, that's what Hosea is saying. He's like, you're going to return back into, either you're going to bondage like you were in Egypt, or you're literally going to go back to Egypt and you're going to disappear in the culture. So it's, a lot of times whenever they give a prophecy like that, there's, there's often a twofold meaning in there. So it's literal and it's spiritual at the same time. Does, does that make sense? It's just, you know, being able to understand, well, what really is going on is, you know, and you, and you can kind of look at it sometimes. Uh, if it is it metaphorical, usually they, they, they'll give some clue that it's a metaphor. But I think in this sense, it's actually even more literal than it is just metaphorically. Um, just because that's the direction that a lot of Israel went, um, especially, especially like Ephraim. And we're going to look at some other things regarding Ephraim. So if you ever want to look at, whenever you're studying your, your Bible and you see things like this and you see a king's name, type in, you know, you can do a Google search, just type in Menahem um, Archaeology or something like that, and it'll pull up. And there, there is a lot of information that can give you some, some background into what was really going on. And then you can look in the scriptures yourself and say, did, did it line up? And here again, it lines up precisely as the scripture says regarding what's going to happen to these guys. So Hosea is written before Menahem does these things. So really what we're, what we're seeing is fulfilled prophecy from Hosea regarding Israel and it becoming this vassal state. Uh, look in 2 Kings chapter 17. Let me get somebody else to read this. Verses 1 through 6. You want to take it, Elon? In the, in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, Hoshea, the son of Elah, became the king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned for nine years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmanes, 
Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against them, and Hoshea become, became his vassal, and he paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria, and he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habar, the river of Gazan, and in the cities of the Medes. So here you have kind of Israel is kind of finished at this point. And basically what Hosea has prophesied has been fulfilled. And the ones that were left, they ended up becoming uh, slaves to Assyrians. And here we had, they, you know, they trusted they, give, they could give some money and pay these guys off. Hosea, or however you say his name here, he, uh, he realizes this will not end well, period. But he tries to buy some time by, by paying them off. And we'll even see some other things um, um, with this. Look in uh, chapter 18 and verse 11 of 2 Kings. Noah, you want to take that one? 18 and verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them. Kind of a just kind of extra, you know. This is this is going on. Uh, Israel's done. Israel's done. You know that the Syrians came in and they purged it. Now, if you turn back to Hosea, he tells us why this happens, and it is basically because Israel's kings encouraged the worship of this pagan calf, the calf in Samaria. That's really all. This is dealing with that judgment of this pagan worship style. That Israel has incorporated and uh, that's what our verses 9 9 through 14 really really capture because they sacrifice flesh for sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it but the Lord accepted them not now he will remember their iniquity and visit their sins they shall return to Egypt so basically you the twofold thing slavery on one end those who ran for their lives went to Egypt, and they disappear in the Egyptian culture. Now, in verse 13, it actually tells us that Judah, Judah also has asked for help, too. Uh, look at 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. Micah, do you have, are you still there? I am. Go ahead and read that verse. Now, 18 21. Yeah, Second Kings eighteen twenty one. Now look, you are relying on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff that will pierce the hand of anyone who grabs it and leans on it. This is what Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is to all who rely upon him. So here, uh, Judah has has sought Egypt for help. Uh, they they see, of course, you know when you start looking at at territories. Um, that are receiving a lot of refugees, they will kind of want to stop it. So the king, of, the king of Judah is thinking, well, if I go and ask Egypt for help, they won't receive all my refugees too because Assyria's coming in and just taking out everybody. So he's trying to make a deal with Pharaoh to help us fight uh, the Assyrians. Uh, it won't end well. It, Judah, Judah will have issues too. So with that, that is... That's Hosea chapter 8, but it kind of leads into, you know, what's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen, uh, you know, to Ephraim. You know, Ephraim, he is, he is supposed to be that leader, and the Lord's going to visit. And that's what we see as we get into chapter 9. So before we continue on, any, any, anybody got any comments or questions uh, so far? I know this is kind of a, a complicated way to study your Bible, but this is really the right way to do it. When you see these prophecies, have these prophecies been fulfilled, 
go and look at the scriptures that kind of go along with it and see what they say. And what we what we see happened is what is is what was prophesied. So that just kind of gives Hosea some credence that man, God's talking to this guy. The Spirit of God's on him. He's speaking God's word. We really need to listen to him. Now here we have what's going to happen to Ephraim. So look in chapter nine. And we're going, to, we're going to look at this chapter a little bit differently. We're going to look at verse 7 first. Um, Jacob, do you, do you have that? Sure. Yeah, read Hosea 9 and verse 7. The days of visitation are come, the days of recompense are come. Israel shall know the prophecy is full the spiritual man. There is not for the multitude of thine iniquity and my hatred. So here we have the days of visitation. So Hosea, he's, he's reaching back and he's like, Ephraim and Israel, the days of visitation are come. You need to be ready. And uh, I, just, I just realized something here that uh, John uses that same, you know, uh, the, the come, that, that word is come or are come or has come, that expression that that really is a point of no return. When you see that phrase in the scripture, that's what you're looking at. The book of Revelation says that too, and uh, that it, it, I forget exactly what chapter it is. It seems like it's around chapter six or seven that says that the, the wrath of God is come. And they wonder, you know, what are they gonna be able to do about this? So it's really kind of a, when you see that expression it's kind of a, an idiom for the point of no return. Once you cross that line, there's no going back. In Revelation, God's wrath is coming. There's nothing that you can do to stop it at this point. It's come, which Jesus uses it in the book of John. He says, my hour has not yet come. So he's like, I haven't got to that point yet. But then later on, he uses that expression, and he says, my day is, my hour is come. This is a point of no return. I must fulfill what what I'm here to do. And it's a point of no return. There's no going back from this point. So when you see that expression in the scripture, that's that's really that's really the idea behind it. Okay? Everybody with me? I know that's you're not going to hear that from a lot of Bible teachers, but I'm telling you, you can look it up for yourself. That's what you see. When that expression's used, it's a point of no return. That's the best way that I can I can see to describe it. So here we have in verse seven that it he uses that expression, are come, twice. That means God's doubled down on it. It's going to happen just like he says. Israel shall know, shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of iniquity and great hatred. And we're going to talk about some of those things as we get into this chapter. But that is a key verse in this chapter to help us understand what is really going on here. So let's go back to verse 1. Um, who would like to take verse 1? Madison, verse 1 of uh, Hosea chapter 9. Do not rejoice, Israel. Do not be jubilant like the other nations. For you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute of, at every threshing floor. All right. So here we have the, uh, the it's talking about the reward upon every uh, threshing floor, which is which is really in in this day, the harvest is payday, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're looking at this payday moment, and they're attributing it to these false gods. That's what he's talking about. They go whoring after these things. What is it talking about? It's talking about the false gods that Israel has allowed in their life, and they have said, "We are attributing our payday to these false gods." Baal has the one is the one who's given this to us, not God. They have not attributed it to the real uh, entity. They've given it to a false entity. So that is how it starts. And they wonder, well, why is the visitation coming? Well, for one, when you don't acknowledge God as the one who's taking care of you, you are off to a very, very bad start in your, in, in your year, right? Look at verse 2. You might want to take that. Josh, you want to take that one? Verse 2? Yeah. The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. So here, he, 
he tells them that what you gather isn't even going to be enough to sustain you. And there's a reason for that. Is because they're going to they're gonna have to deal with all of these sieges coming in from Assyria. So it doesn't matter how much they take in, it's not going to be enough. And, of course, that's one of the ways that they used to do battles back then. In fact, I would recommend, I, I would suggest that that's, that's probably the way that those would do battle these days. I mean, we see that in Russia, the way that they're dealing with Ukraine is that they're limiting supplies, that the, a lot of the things that they're doing is really to starve the Ukrainians out of their country so that they'll be forced to surrender. Um, when a nation begins to go in to, to attack another nation, before they start firing and doing a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat is that they will shut down the food supply to the best of their ability. They want to weaken the people. They want to make the people hungry. They, want, they don't want them to be a strong force. They want them to be a hungry, starving force. Um, and if you, when you start seeing you know, supplies in this nation start to you know, lack thereof, you can probably bet that we are under attack. Just no bullets have started flying yet. And you, you look for these things. I mean, that's, that's the nature of war, okay? That's the nature of war that we're not taught. You know, we're not taught these things in, you know, in school, right? You're not taught how to, how to fight a war in school. Now, if you grew up in a war environment, you'd be taught these things because we'd be looking at you to be a general one day. But these are the things that, you know, we, we studied whenever, during World War II, and I, I realize I'm giving you a lot of history, but Germany, whenever, whenever they wanted to conquer the, you know, uh, the e, I think it was the east part of Germany, or Berlin, right? Berlin is this major, major place. If they can, if Nazi Germany can take over Berlin, they've got it, right? They, they won the whole state. So what they did is they, 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 they kind of surrounded it with the wall to cut it off, to starve the people out and force the surrender of, of the Western, of this Western stronghold. Well, what we did in the United States is we had these airlifts in which we dropped tons and tons of food inside of there so that the people could withstand. If they're not hungry, they'll it's make the Soviet it. Union, right? Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. It's the Soviet Union. I'm getting some of my people mixed up. Yeah. So, so the Soviet Union is trying to is trying to shut off this major stronghold in the West, and that's the way they do they do it. Uh, and this is it was Cold War, okay? This, so this is after the Cold War. So yeah, I'm getting some of my history mixed up. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I've got too many things running through my mind at, at once without notes, so uh, I apologize. So anyway, so thank you, Isaac, for for setting me for getting my my history back on track. So the Cold War is going on. The Soviets are trying to to take old, trying to win a major a major uh, position in the Western culture by starving out the Berlin by Berlin, right? Cutting off their food supply. They're doing a really really good job. So we end up flying in all of these uh, airlifts and we're dropping food uh, every day, just tons and tons of airlifts and we're dropping these food this food to sustain the people there. In Berlin until the Soviets back away and, we, it, and it worked it worked that we won that that offensive without bullets being without bullets being fired they were fighting with food that's how they were doing it so that is a pretty modern warfare technique but it's not just a modern technique it's it's something that was that's just the nature of war going all the way back to this point so this that's what that verse is talking about the food you gather is not going to be enough because you're going to have to deal with all of these contingencies around you. They're going to be uh, they're going to be blocking off the the food supply. You're not going to have enough to get you through, and you're going to be forced to surrender. That's basically what Hosea is telling them. See, he's telling them what's going to happen. Uh, so, with that, any, any questions so far? All right, let's skip down to verse eight. In verse eight, somebody take verse eight for me. Joy, you want to take? Do not do nine through ten, actually. Eight through ten. Eight through ten. Eight through ten. The watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways, and hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Syria. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. 
I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first wife and the fig tree at her time, that they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves into that shape. And their abominations were according as they loved. All right, so here we see that um, Israel is trusting in their own prophets rather than God's prophets. And you can see, if you've, if you've been a student of the Old Testament, that you see that Israel hated God's prophets. It's like God's prophets never gave them what they wanted. Well, there was a reason for that. They were in sin against God, and God was bringing judgment on Israel. So when they would go into these battles, they thought, well, I don't know why you're, you, who's the prophet of God, why you're so against me, but these guys over here, they're saying it's going to be all good. You're going to do well. And, you know, that's what, that's what we see. We see the hatred build up towards God's people that say, guys, you're doing everything against God's word, against his principles, and you expect good things in, out of it, to come out of it. It's not going to happen. And because they're, they seem so negative that in, in our modern tongue, we would say they're just full of hate speech. They're bigots. They're they you know they they're just uh, you know whatever, right? They're right wing conspiracists or whatever. That's that's what they would that that would be the modern lingo for what they are experiencing in the prophets. So what does God do? I mean, you can't if you're a believer in God, it is going to be very difficult for you to survive in that type of environment. So they disappear. I mean, we saw that during Elijah's day, he thought he was the only one left. God told him, you're not, but there's only 7,000. What is 7,000 out of millions? Not much, right? Those guys can really be scattered. That'd and, be what, maybe 2%? I don't even think it's 2%. It, it, well, it'd be 1% if there's 7 million. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, so we're talking about le less than 1% are believers okay. in Israel at this time. In that, that's tough. It's 2% right now. It's 2% right now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, in Israel? Right now, Christians? Yeah, it's yeah. 2%. Yeah, it's 2% right now, and 2% can hide really, really well. And so we're looking at, you know, somewhere around like 0.5%, maybe, that uh, are believers in Israel. And so if, if, if that, a lot of times God's people, if this is just me. If I was living in an environment like this, and I knew that there was a better environment like in Judah, because, where they're worshiping God the right way, and they're not, you know, they're, I'm not going to lose my job if I go to church on Sunday, or if I read my Bible, or if I... If I pray, you know, in, in in Europe, I think it was in England that they arrested a woman because she was praying silently to herself. Making, was, making people feel unsafe. Yeah, she was making people feel unsafe by just standing there, leaning up against something with her head down, praying inside her heart. Oh, they, they have no prayer zones now. So, that's, that's, you know, if you can if you can imagine, that's where that's where we're that's kind of where we're at in our Western ideology. Just think, these guys they they're not they hang Christians up all the time. And if you're against what the king says, man, you're you're just not going to have a good day. These guys would flee, so the prophets would be diminished in Israel. And that's what verse eight is telling us. The old and you think about it, the old prophets they agreed with God. The new ones they became a snare. They were just full of lies. They were all lies. Right, so you can't trust them, and it's very interesting. You know, this is just kind of a modern thing that uh, the Southern Baptists. I don't know if y'all keep up with the politics of religious culture, but uh, the Southern Baptists they made uh, they kind of made some statement of faith, and they're holding on to to the standard principles in the Scripture regarding uh, uh, women's roles inside of the church, and they've stood firm on that. Well, all of a sudden you have. Uh, uh, Saddleback Church is, you know, rejected because they're like, no, we're going to do what we want to do. And they're like, well, you're out. So they're out. And that's a huge church, you know, under Rick Warren's leadership in, uh, in California. And now you have Elevation Church out on the East Coast that they have said, well, you know what, we're not going to be a part of the Southern Baptist anymore either. And I don't know if you're familiar with Elevation Church. 
Vendetta. I forget what that guy's name is, but he, you know, he's a cool looking guy. Got some big muscles, wears tight t-shirts, stuff like that. Aren't they sub-songs? Mm -hmm. Minor Omission yep. 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 So they're like, we're out. Was that we don't, just over women roles, or was it also just LGBTQ as well? They, uh, they, said that, uh, like they said that women's roles was like the gateway that led to like all these, that was like, it was just the first step of many mm -hmm. when accepting everything else. Because once you accept that women pastors uh, can be exist where they deny women's roles, which they use the Bible, make fill women's roles of women. Right. women right and the difference yeah. Yeah. what do they say in response when you're, when you're just like well here's the scripture and it's exceedingly clear that, that's, that's, that's just cool. the one epistle it's that one church it doesn't it doesn't just think it's not enough well a lot of times they don't agree with they don't agree with paul's writings. they're like that was for that culture at that time it doesn't apply oh, to us well, yeah. mm -hmm. that means anything's up for grabs <laughs> exactly right. and, and that's the danger that's the danger in that so, uh, you also have like the, uh, the Methodist church. This Methodist church in Jonesboro is trying to leave, but like the Methodist community is like, no, we want your money, please don't leave. Well, yeah, well, that building is worth about $30 million. So they're like, they don't want to be out of that. Out of that. I don't want to be like, way off topic by jumping into that. But so when you say, well, that's the way it was with the women's leadership, and it should be like that, you know, don't, we don't take culture into it, that's just the way it should be. Well, then what about like women? We should, have, we should have our face covers, right? Like, how do you differentiate between women should have a face covering during prayer and at church and worship to not being in leadership? How do you tell which is still relevant, which is not? I'm, I'm torn on that because you see that a lot. Like, you know, should yeah, we? I think it has, I think it has more, well, I'm not saying that the culture doesn't, doesn't reflect some of the nature of the, of the scriptures because you, if you look to see what was going on in the pagan worship versus, you know, what how God wanted us to worship. So when you look at pagan worship, I mean, you're you're looking at women who would kind of reveal themselves as as young men a lot of times, and then you would have the men who would dress up as women, and you know, and that's what's that's what Paul is trying to counter. He's trying to counter that false worship that, that we see like in Ephesus and Corinth with all of that temple prostitution going on. So he says, you know, you, women need to make sure, they need to present themselves not like they present themselves in the temple, but they need to adorn themselves like women. And he would even talk about certain forms of modesty at the same time because they would be immodest at the same time. It wasn't just their heads being covered. He talked about modesty, which Oh my goodness! You want to you want to cause a church to go into a turmoil? You start telling people to be modest. I mean, when when did it become such a bad idea to put clothes on and cover yourself? I mean, it, the scripture talks about it all through there. He even and he begins with men. He tells men, you know, back in the back in the Old Testament when the temp, when the when the high priest he would go up. And there was the altar there, right? So he would have to walk up these steps onto the altar. The scripture tells him he needs to wear bridges underneath his robe. Okay, so he needs to wear pants because people don't need to see what you got going on underneath there either. Right? So it wasn't just against women. The first comment about modesty is actually geared towards men. That men need to have their clothes on too. And so anyway, that's just... You know, take it into the you know the whole surrounding helps us to understand what are those scriptures really referring to, and I think the women thing is is really geared towards the uh, the temple worship and the prostitution that's going on there. That women need to you know they need to make sure that they don't look like those temple prostitutes. I believe. I mean, you know, it I, it is a complicated verse though to have to have the cover. But he tells us he tells the women that your hair is your covering, right? I mean, doesn't the scripture t say that? Uh, about one part it doesn't. Another it does. It makes it seem. Like yeah, I, you know, I always found that that verse was so was weird. I'm like, well, of course, women have longer hair than men, unless they're trying to be a boy, right? And I didn't realize, you know, until recently, that there were so many women back in those days that would present themselves as as men. Just as you know, we see, you know, we see in our drag culture today that men are trying to show themselves as women. I didn't really realize how 
how pagan that that is. And I think that's I think that's what it what it's talking about. Yeah, where they gave and became chosen, and when you see them, they gave the life they should have. Yeah. That's how I remember. To. Yeah, I, I didn't catch that. But yeah, you, you might be right. Because the women who were with Jesus, they all had long hair. Yeah, could be something there. I really want to knock this stuff out for you guys. Uh, so anybody got any more questions on that? I mean, it's good to, I think that's a good discussion. Maybe it helps to understand some of the attributes going on. So it results in hatred about against God's house and his people. In verse 9, it says that they corrupted themselves. They turned to Baal Peor. So again... Bel Peor, when you see that, does anybody remember what that what that's talking about? That's going back to Balaam, and his name was called uh, his his name was called Peor, right? Does anybody remember what his advice was? Bel's advice. Yeah, well, Bel Peor, what what that what that phrase is referring to? So if you go back to Numbers and you read about Balaam, he ends up giving some advice to the king who wants to kill Israel, right? And his advice is to have get Israel where they will accept your sons and daughters, and when they accept your sons and daughters, they will accept your false gods. When they accept your false gods, they will begin to do all of these sexual immoral acts with your false gods because that's what they're supposed to do in that religious system. That's, that's really what Bel Peor is, is, is referring to. So you would have these guys that they would think, well, I need to have, I want, I want a good crop this year. I have to go have relations with so many of these different prostitutes. And they would probably, they'd have to pay for it. So you're, so they're, it's, it's really just a, a prostitution ring is, is really what's going on. They're getting rich off of people's, you know, thoughts and, and false precepts. So, or if they want to have children, man, we can't conceive. We want to have children. So what do we got to do? Well, your wife has got to go, uh, go ha have relations with this pro uh, temple prostitute so she, can, so she can conceive. So those are the ideas that's going on there. And that is what Israel has turned to. They have accepted these pagan rituals. It sounds like the Canaanites in um, Judges 2. Yes. It's kind of the same rhythm of them not learning their lesson. Mm -hmm. Same thing, same thing. So, looking back at verse 3, okay? So, verse 3, it says, For now they, now they shall say we have no king, but, oh, wrong chapter. I knew that didn't sound right. But they shall not dwell in, Lord, in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. They shall eat unclean things in Assyria. So, here, again, it talks about Ephraim being scattered. Some of them are going to go to Egypt. Some of them are going to go to Assyria, but they're not going to be in God's land. They're no longer going to be able to worship God and will be completely pagan and consumed by the surrounding nations. Somebody take verses 4 through 6 for me. Chapter 10? Uh, chapter 9. Chapter 9. I got it. Isaiah 4 through 6, chapter 10? Yeah. yeah, chapter 9. Right. They will not pour out wine offerings to the Lord, nor will, they sacrifice, nor will their sacrifices please Him. Such sacrifices will be taken to them like the bread of mourners. All who eat them will be unclean. The food will be for themselves. It will not come into the temple of the Lord. What will you do on the day of your appointed festivals, on the feast days of the Lord? Even if they escape from destruction, Egypt will gather them in Memphis, will bury them. Their treasures of silver will be taken over by briar, and thorns will overrun their tents. So basically, Ephraim is really going to be punished in, in this advent. Uh, they're losing everything. They're going to lose their land. They're going to be consumed by the nations. They're going to lose their, their whole identity. Um, the glory, look, in, look down to verse 11. I know there's a lot of skipping around, but I'm trying to, to kind of hone in all of the verses referring to the topics in this. So this talks about kind of the line of Ephraim, uh, verses 11 through 13. Anybody want to take those three? Go ahead, Isaac. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them. 
there that there shall not be a man left, yea, woe unto them when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is implanted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his child, children to the murderer. So here we have some really bad things that's going to happen to Ephraim. Uh, the line is going to disappear, and they're going to be no more. Uh, some really, just really treacherous things. Now, while I was studying this, I found it interesting that uh, if you type in, you know, what happened to Ephraim, you know, why is their line going to disappear? There are many who teach that America is Ephraim, the lost tribe of Israel. I found that that was very interesting. Uh, I don't know if there's anything really behind that, uh, at least not scriptural wise, but there is a thinking process that the United States has become or is Ephraim. Now, when you look at verses 13 through 17, Isaac read uh, some of those. Anybody want to take those final, final verses? Where did you stop? 13? Yes, sir. Read 14 through 17. Anybody you want to take it, my other Isaac? Or Caden. Caden, you hadn't read. You're hiding over there on the side. <laughs> 14 through 17. Yeah. Just, I tell you what, start at 13 and just go through 17. Just that extra verse there. Yeah. Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murder. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them as miscarrying wound that is dried up. All of their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there, there I hate them. smitten, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit, yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even them, even ye beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. So here we have some things that are going to happen to Ephraim. Uh, in verse 13, You'll see what happened, what they do there. They execute their own children. Now, a lot of this has to do with worshiping Moloch, but it's it. I just find it interesting if uh, that there's so many that claim that America is Ephraim that uh, that is exactly what we have done. Seventy million children are now under our belt just in the abortion uh, mills. Of executed children and then in verse 14 it says that they're plagued by miscarries and the inability to nurse their babies and and I, and I find it very interesting that you know it seems like a, I know a bunch of people that have had a, had miscarries and some people have had a lot of miscarries um, so that that is you know it's a horrible thing to happen to uh, to a young lady and in a family, but that that's what the scripture says is going to happen to Ephraim. So basically, God is just kind of limit, you know, wiping them out. Their numbers are decreasing. They're just gonna they're just gonna be dissolved in in the world. In verse fifteen, they're hated by God for their evils, and they're driven from His house. So when you see these type of evil things happening in that culture, um, you can see that God starts driving them out from the from their own possessions especially the possession that god gave to them as himself right um, in verse 16 we see two things that the statehood is struck down and the roots are dried up and that and we read that with with the syrians coming in that their statehood is is basically take consumed by the assyrians and the root is is dried up and I'll, I'll show you that a little bit more in a, in a minute about what uh, what that actually means in fact uh, when you read the scriptures there's another prophecy that talks about the two the two sticks Israel and Judah one day becoming one so that there really is no distinction between the tribes and I think it's very much that case now with with the Jews so Ephraim is just the, the root of Israel is just kind of dried up in fact we don't even, whenever we refer to somebody from Israel, what do we call them? Israel. 
Yeah, like, well, we call them, well, we don't call them Israelites now. We call them Jews, right? Mm -hmm. Why do we call them Jews? Because the Jewish state. Exactly, yeah. but, but why Jew? Because why do we use that we term? We don't follow their tribes anymore. Well, they started calling them Jews because it was, Jew is short for Judah. That's it. When uh, when they started when they went into captivity into Babylon, the Babylonians they would distinguish people that were taken captive from Judea, and they would just call them Jews because all the people got they just all got mixed up into that group. So that's how that they it was kind of a, a derogatory term towards that group, and uh, you know to refer to them well you're just you're a Jew, and they would call them that, and it stuck it stuck even to today. That they, but they've accepted that term of derogatory uh, against them as, well, that's your Jew. Kind of like as Christian, that they were first called Christians in Antioch. It wasn't, it wasn't a term of kindness. It was a term of hate. And as believers, they, they embraced that term. That, yes, I am a Christian. I am what you hate. And all of a sudden now, it's a world-known term, and is it? And it kind of distinguishes us as his people, set apart as a Christian versus, you know, something else. Does that yeah. make sense? Anabaptists started as an insult, too. Yes, Anabaptists, too. Yep. We claim the Baptist part. Yeah. <laughs> I think, like, during the Holocaust, too, they used to just call them Jews. They did. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's, really, they were just a number. <laughs> right, right. They had and a it, number tattooed on them. Exactly. I mean. <laughs> and it, and it, it stuck. Uh, yeah. Rather than, but they, they never call them Reubenites or uh, Ephraimites or anything like that again. Uh, and those that, and those, then those that survive, we see in verse 16 that they, uh, that God will remove them. You know, if they were, if they survive all this other stuff, God ends up removing them from, from kind of the line there. In verse 17, it, it reveals that they're rejected by God because they did not listen to Him. And they become wanderers in the nations, and that's exactly what we've seen with the, you know, with the Hebrew people, is that they became wanderers in all the nations. There was a ton of them in in, um, in Russia. There was a ton of them in Europe. Uh, when uh, when Europe became such a detrimental place to the to the Jewish people, America became a place that they migrated to. Um, I kind of think that that's why God established. America and, and got her founded was per, in preparation for a World War II event, the Holocaust, that they had a place in the United States to flee to, and then God used that to rebuild the nation state of Israel. The whole thing in like Revelation, like wings of the eagle for a time would, uh, per, like, is, is that you think? Have you heard that? I have. Yeah. You think that's what it's referring to? You think that's something else? I don't know. I haven't put a lot of thought into it. I could, though. Um. <laughs> you put a lot of thought into things. It's really not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a, you know the even the thought of a of the United States being a, a safe haven for you know for the Jewish people. I mean that that kind of makes sense. You know, I know we're getting kind of late on our time here, but a lot of times God makes a safe place for His people. He has yeah. a place for us to run to for for Lot. He says, the safe place for you is to go into the mountains. You need to go up there, and you need to get there as fast as you can. And he, and he pulls him out of the place that he was going to destroy. Um, we see that with Jerusalem, when Titus comes into Jerusalem. How many Christians were killed in Jerusalem? I think there were zero because of the persecution that, was already had, that had already happened because of Saul of Tarsus and then the other, uh, the other persecution that came from the, the Jews and the Romans, that it was just not a safe place for a Christian, period. If you were a Christian, you were going to lose your job. Your house was going to get torn down anyway or ablaze. They wanted you out. So if you were a visible Christian, you didn't have a home in Jerusalem. So when Titus comes in, there's nowhere, there's probably no Christians there. They'd all fled to Antioch and to Babylon and Rome and other places where it was safer than Jerusalem. Yeah, by the time you make it to the end of the book of Acts, it's pretty clear that it's, it's not a safe place for them at all. Exactly. But we, we, but we see that all throughout the scriptures that when, when something is going to happen, God has already 
started removing his people a long time before. So that's when you see, and here, okay, God has been moving people from California, right? There are so many people leaving California. Most of them are believers. I've met many believers from the West. What's going on? I believe God is removing them because something bad is going to happen. That's just... What's not going on is the question. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there, there's something to it. I want to wrap this up by showing you one final thing regarding Ephraim. If you'll look in Revelation chapter 7, I found that this is a very interesting thing. Um, when I was reading through it one day, I found it uh, interesting. Okay? Chapter 7 begins to speak of the 144,000 Jews in the last days that are sealed, that, have, that are servants of God, that are sealed in those last days. Okay? I'm going to read this for you, and I want you to listen for the tribe of Ephraim. Okay? It says, and starting at verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and were sealed 144,000 of the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Ishakar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Where is Ephraim? Nowhere. Joseph? Like, you have a joke. Like, you have, like, you always had, like, the half tribe of Manasseh, half the tribe of Ephraim. Mm -hmm. He said, did it say Manasseh? And then also his tribe of Joseph? It. The 12, the 12 tribes, Ephraim was a part of the 12 tribes, but here in Revelation, it leaves out two, okay? It leaves out the tribe of Dan, and it also leaves out Ephraim. Dan is the, is, you know, is the one in which they, they put the, the golden calf, and they, they, turn, they turn completely pagan, and Ephraim is not mentioned. However, Joseph is mentioned, but Ephraim was a, was a son of Joseph, but Manasseh was also a, a son of Joseph. So here we have God reaching back. He's like, Ephraim is done. Jo I'm going back to the other sons of Joseph, but not Ephraim. I just found that that's very interesting that here we have God says in Hosea, Ephraim is done. I'm not working with him anymore. Any of his people, um, I'm reaching back even further for, for, those, for those. But they are counted out even at the end. I just found that really interesting. Maybe you don't, I don't know, but I found it very interesting that almost all the other tribes are there, but Dan and Ephraim, which were both leaders in the pagan worship that came into Israel. And God prophesied those. That we could go in a whole other study about why Dan is not mentioned, but Ephraim is told here in Hosea chapter 9, this is why I'm getting rid of you. You're not gonna you're gonna be completely wiped out. But God reaches back past even Ephraim. I guess Joseph probably had I'm sure he had some other kids. So those are the ones that God is like, you know what? They're better. It's kind of like uh, when when you start looking at at Jesus lineage, you know. He came from the tribe of Nathan, or, or tribe of Nathan, from the, from the lineage of Nathan rather than of Solomon. You know, on Mary's side. Now he he is sent. He he has the authority because of his stepfather Joseph, who was who was on David's side, right? But Nathan is still one of one of David's sons, right? So we have Jesus come through that line. That hasn't that hadn't been tainted by, um, by uh, um, I forget what the guy's name is. It starts with a J. But he he had done he had he had received God's word and he rejected it. He tore it up and threw it into the fire. And God said, because you did that, 
uh, Jeconiah, I think is his name. It's, and uh, God prophesied, none of your line will ascend the throne of, will ascend the throne of David. So when, so when we see Jesus come along, he's not really born of the line of, of that line of David. He's born actually of the line of Nathan through Mary. And just as a stepson to Joseph. Powerful how God put that together so cohesively. And here we have the book of Revelation does the same, a uh, very similar thing with Ephraim. So, Is that the chapter where they're called the first fruits of each tribe? Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Because I always read it as the first twelve thousand believers from each tribe that were sealed. Right. And they have to be they have to be male virgins too, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that, I always read it as that because by this time, like in our current era, like, oh, we're not supposed to stress over meeting uh, endless genealogies and everything like right. Paul says. But at that time the tribes were very clear and those people were available mm -hmm. and they're sealed from that time. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that context, you know, uh, is, you know, is, it, it is the context of, of chapter 7. Mm -hmm. um, I just found it interesting that Ephraim was not yeah, mentioned. Not there. Yeah. So, but yeah, that is, the, I think that's the accurate context of chapter 7. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other study, too. <laughs> so, with that, any final thoughts? Let me get you guys out of here. Dear Lord. That you would just be with this group of young folks. That you would just help them, Lord, as they as they learn of your word. Help them to be able to apply these things in their own lives. That you would just comfort them in all your ways. That you would strengthen their spirits, Lord. That they may be able to understand and be and to know what you're what you're doing and how you want to use them in this in this world. So I just pray for your hedge of protection on them. Help them, Lord, to be just conquerors. Uh, with the, uh, uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ in the places that they go to and the people that they're around. Help them, Lord, to be your witnesses. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name.